Well, it's uh, lovely to be here with you, and thank you very much. I think it was Bob that invited me, uh, possibly a few months ago, and when he asked uh, way back then, it's easy to say yes. But when it comes near to the time, you feel tension and you, you feel, well, what have I let myself in for here? And uh, so I did a wee bit of uh, research to see of previous speakers, and the list was Carl Truman, Martin Allen, Paul Helm, and Alistair Donald. And I thought, my goodness, this must be a mistake. So I thought, this is going to cause tension within my own life, thinking, and possibly others, to think, how has he been invited? Uh, to come and speak at such a prestigious uh, event. But to be honest, for me, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak at uh, this uh, lecture. And that, uh, Douglas McMillan was someone who, in many lives, had a huge impact. And uh, I remember years ago being at an induction of a free church minister in Inverness and uh, Douglas was a colleague and a friend of the man that was being inducted and uh, there was a talk table where the minister and his wife and family sat and Douglas and Mrs. McMillan would have been there and, but Douglas was there, I, I can still remember clearly and Douglas was going to speak on behalf of his colleague and friend and uh, when he stood up, he said that, he says, I want to tell you a story about uh, a minister in Sky that on a Saturday evening, when he used to finish off uh, his sermons, he, to round off his sermons, he used to like to go for a walk uh, in the moonlight. And uh, this evening, he took the usual route and he went over, there was this bridge that he came to and he would go over that and he would stand above the bridge and look down into the river. But this night, one of the local characters was standing there before he got there. And the worst for wear, a Saturday evening, he had other things uh, on his mind and he was looking down into the river. And when he saw the minister, the minister blessed the evening to him and, uh, and then he said to him, Minister, can you tell me what is that down in the river as he was looking down? So what he was looking at was the re reflection of the moon. And the minister said to him, well, that would be the moon. So the man said to him, well, he said, if that is the moon, what am I doing up here? <laughs> <laughs> and in many ways, that's how I feel. That is how the tension that I've been feeling in regards to this, when I realize what this is all about, what am I doing? Uh, up here. But there's something else as well in regards to my own personal uh, salvation. I remember uh, years ago when the Lord was drawing me to himself. I was reading the Bible, of course, but I was also reading Douglas's book, The Lord Our Shepherd. And I was working in Perthshire uh, on the A9, that beautiful road that goes up north to Inverness, which we all love. And uh, I went, I had to go and see, I had to go and see a minister somewhere. The minister that was at that time in Perth was David Patterson. Now, when I went there, I couldn't find the church. I don't know if anyone can ever find the church in Perth, to be honest, you know, where it is. But when I, uh, in those days, it was back in the 80s, when you went to a phone book, there was no mobile phones. You went to a phone box and you would find a telephone book. That is pre-days where they were put in fire through vandalism. And I found uh, his number, so I phoned him. I was just going to ask him, can you tell me when the midweek meeting is? And, uh, and uh, that's all I was going to ask him. I was going to tell him anything. And, uh, but anyway, knowing those of you who knew David Patterson, he had to find out everything about me. So I told him who I was, and he said, you're going to have to come to the house. You can't go back to Killacranky without, first of all, coming to see me. Now... I wasn't a Christian at that time, and when I went in, he said to me, eh, when did you become a Christian? And I said, well, I'm not a Christian. And he said, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, to be honest, I don't know. So anyway, he took me into, uh, took me into his study, and uh, uh, it was really interesting, all the things that took place that night. His wife went away, she made us a cup of tea, and uh, he asked me what I was reading, and I told him that I was reading uh, Douglas McMillan's book, The Lord, Our Shepherd, and obviously the Bible. And he said to me, do you know, he said, that I was with Douglas the night he was converted? And you know, I couldn't believe this. To happen to be with the same man 
when I was enjoying the book that I was reading that Douglas wrote. And here I am with the guy that was with him the night he was converted. Now, what is incredible is, the whole thing, I'll tell you something before we move on in regards to our talk. Have we got two hours? <laughs> he said to me, before you leave, he said, I'm going to pray, and then you're going to pray. Well, for a West Coaster like myself from Scarpy, to pray before, in front of the minister, this just didn't happen. <coughs> because in our custom way back then, was that when you became a Christian, you tended to wait for a few years so that the elders knew what kind of person you were, and then after a couple of years, you would sit at the Lord's table, you would go before the elders. And then after that, the minister would leave you for six months before asking you to pray. Now, I wasn't even a Christian, and he's asking me to pray in front of him. Well, he prayed first, and I didn't hear a word he said, to be honest, because all I was thinking of, what am I going to do here? And do you know what I did? I prayed in Gaelic so he wouldn't know what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord knew. And that is what was so important. But what is amazing is that the year I did, shortly after that, I did sit at the Lord's table for the first time. The person who was inducted to the congregation in Inverness, he was the minister. And who happened to be there that weekend for the communion weekend was Douglas Macmillan. And for some reason, he wanted to sit in with the elders to listen to what I had to say. And it was just incredible to think that he was there and so much part of my time of coming to Christ. Now, like I said, I spoke in regards, asking to speak. And what I want to speak about is evangelism in a tense world. And I thought about in regards to the tension that I felt coming to speak to you, dear folk, today and wondering what on earth... I'm going to talk about. So I thought, right, okay, I'm feeling tense about this, so I'm going to speak about tension within evangelism. I'm just basically speaking through my own experience of what it's been like. I was saying to Professor McLeod today, to Nancy McLeod, that it's been 2004 was the year we left. So that is 11 years in ministry. So just to uh, put us in the picture of what tension means, I'll give you the meaning from Chambers' Dictionary. It says this, a pulling strain or a strained state. Tension under emotions can mean excitement, anxiety, or hostility. And the word tense means stretched, tight, strained, or producing strain. All of these things we know, but it's interesting when you look at words in dictionary. It means to tighten or to narrow. Now, what are the symptoms of tension. Well, it can be strained relations between persons, oppositions between conflicting ideas. Now, I thought about a recent tension within our own nation, something that we possibly all can relate to, and especially all of the, those of us here who are Scottish. If I was to mention the word Craig Jurbe or Joubert, would you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course, it is that referee that gave Australia a penalty two minutes from the end of a rugby match in the quarter-final. And the result was that Australia won by one point. Now, since then, World Rugby have said that Jurbe was wrong in awarding that penalty. Now, what is interesting is this. Can you imagine the tension at the game? That guy did. Jurbe felt the tension. Because immediately after he blew the final whistle, he ran straight off the pitch. Why? Because he must have known that he made a mistake. Or, how could he stay in a place, in a cauldron of 82,000 fans, and most of them Scots? He must have felt the tension. But the thing is this, we're talking about a rugby match. It's only a game. But how does it generate so much tension? Well, why do we get so tense? And what has this got to do with evangelism? Well, this is the environment that you folk hope to go out in and to minister in. You hope to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into a tense world. And how are we to do that? Well, first of all, I want us to look at the source of tension Secondly, how do we deal with tension within our own lives and how do we deal with tension 
between ourselves and others? And then thirdly, how do we deal with tension in the life of ministry as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in a tense world? So first of all, the source of tension. Well, you guys, you've been speaking about how the temple has been raised from now on until the end of the year, simply because you've got assignments to hand in and it's going to come to that dreaded time of exams. I can relate well to that and remember it well. And uh, But the thing is this, if you do your work and you learn what you've been given uh, to learn and the questions that you are given, if you fully understand the question, then you are able to give the right answers. Now, what is the situation at the very beginning that we believe that Jesus is the answer to? And it is this, that we are all alienated from God. That is the bottom line. That is the problem that we find in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve rebelled. They rebelled against God's word. They rebelled against the grace that God had shown them. To the point that God came asking in the garden, where are you? Where were they? They were hiding from God behind trees. Well, how ridiculous is that? Hiding behind trees? You see, poison had been injected into the stream of humanity, and they are now alienated from God. So, a suspicion arises in the hearts of Adam and Eve, a suspicion of their Heavenly Father, and the question is, his love is miserly, he has shown us a miserly love, and there is suspicion about his character. This is what he is like. Now, Lubold highlights, he says this, Here is one of the saddest anticlimax of history. They eat, they expect marvellous results, they wait, and there grows on them the sense of shame. So what you have now in our world is suspicion, a threat, a hostility, and tension. That is what our world is like from then on. Now, if there's tension between two people, the last thing you want to do is to meet that person, to be honest. And when you do meet that person, it's kind of awkward, because there is this tension between you. And it's interesting what has now come into a built-in circuit within our lives is this, that if you do something wrong, then you blame someone else. You know, it's interesting when you see children. Our first two boys were, there's only a year between them. But what is interesting is that if one did something wrong, he would blame the other. Now that is something that we never taught them to do. It is an inbuilt circuit. And it has come from the fall of Adam. And it's interesting what happened. Adam blamed God. Remember, he said, if you had, give, if you had not given her to me, it's your fault. You gave me Eve, and this is what she has done. So there is tension at the very beginning. So how do we deal then with tension with our own lives and tension between ourselves and others? Well, we notice, what did Adam do? He hid himself from God. And that is exactly what we did. We avoided anyone that spoke to us or who knew that was going to speak to you about the gospel. It is something that we didn't want to do. We didn't want to meet them. It was awkward for you if someone spoke to you about the gospel. Philip Yancey, in his book, uh, What is So Amazing About Grace, tells the story of a prostitute in Chicago. And uh, she found herself destitute. She was homeless. She was sick. She was unable to look after her two-year-old daughter. She came to a friend of Yancey's once, and he said to her, he said this, I could hardly hear her sordid, uh, sordid story. At last I asked if she had ever thought of going to church for help. I will never forget the look of pure naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible enough about myself. They would just make me feel worse. There is tension between ourselves and God, there is tension between the destitute and the church. Now thankfully, and I hope that we're all here today, we are saved through Christ and his spirit now dwells in our hearts to sanctify us. 
The Shorter Catechism tells us sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man. After the image of God, and are enabled more and more to die to sin and to live and to righteousness. Now this means the work of sanctification in our lives. It means that every aspect of our lives is being dealt with through the work of sanctification. That is everything that went wrong at the fall. God is now dealing with all of these issues. Now we all know we're sinners. And the gospel, uh, where we find the heart of the gospel explained for us in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3. And uh, where there it speaks of that no one is righteous, no, not one. And I think that is something, as those of us who are going to go out with the gospel, is something that we ought to remember daily. That no one is righteous, not one. So your salvation and my salvation does not depend on me, it doesn't depend on you, it doesn't depend on us. It simply depends on the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when we put that in place, every day that we rise and we think of what God has saved us from, we can then claim the gospel for ourselves and we can say, we can say verses like, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We can claim that for ourselves. So if that is the case, there is now no condemnation, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If we can claim that, does that mean that there is no tension between us and God? No tension? Well, it ought to be. Because we have been <coughs> saved by grace through what he has done. But when you think of our relationship, we sometimes think that our relationship is about being performance-based. It is what I can do for the Lord. And there's a danger of that in ministry. When we think of what am I going to do? What kind of results am I going to leave behind? And people are going to say that was a useless ministry. It is, is it performance-based? God loves me. Because I remember a preacher being with us one time uh, in Smithton, I, uh, a guy Benton, he was, the, uh, the, he, did, he was the editor of one of the newspapers, I can't remember his first name, he was in Guildford in a Baptist church, and he said, can you imagine if your wife said to me, and he, was, he, uh, he's, he had seen me previous and he was on about, can you imagine the fact that if your wife said to you, Kenny, I love you, because of your curls. Now, I used to be known as Kenny Curley. Okay? You have to use your imagination. But can you imagine if your wife said to you, I love you because... Now, if God was going to say that to us, how would we feel? What will happen when I grow old and I become bald? Is she not going to love me anymore? It is conditional. Now the thing is this, if we think that our salvation, and there is a danger of this going from the principle of grace to think that our salvation to do with being performance based, we need to be careful about that. Because that is not the way it is. I love you because I love you. Unconditionally. That is what God is saying. That is why we ought to preach the gospel to ourselves daily, to remind ourselves of that. Okay, so what about then the tension between ourselves and others? Well, what do we see from the very beginning? There was tension between Adam and Eve. And for those of you who are married, you know that uh, men, you know that uh, women don't think like you do. And women definitely know that we don't think like them. In fact, you don't have to be married eh, to understand that. But I can maybe generalize here, and, and I am generally speaking, when I speak about men, when we do a task, we want to do that task and that task only, and we'll do it until we complete it. I don't know if you've ever seen a man with a power washer. Now, he is a determined person to get the job done and nothing is going to take him away from it. 
If you see the difference between that man, he's going to be focused and he'll do a 12 hour shift with possibly a 10 minute break and he'll stick to it all day. But give a woman a power washer, she'll do the area where she's going to put the washing out in first. And then she'll put it down, put the washing out, and then she'll go in, she put the kettle on, back out to the power washer, she goes back in and does lunch for the children. And before you know it, at the end of the shift, she's finished as well. Where the man thought that he's in power all day, just doing the one task. Now the difference between men and women is, we just do single tasks. Women can multitask. Yeah? So, they can multitask. So, there is one thing that men are really good at. And that is doing nothing. And when a woman asks you, what are you doing? And you say, nothing. Now, that's deadly. They just can't get their heads around that. So, what does that mean? There is tension there. It causes tension within the marriage. Two people who love each other and there's tension. Now you folk, you hope to go into ministry and those of you who are going into full-time ministry as preachers, you hope to have your own congregations. Now you're going to have 10, 20, 100, 200 people. And when you leave seminary, this is what you hope to do. So if you've got tension between two people who love each other, imagine what it's like to be a minister in charge of a congregation. What do you do with the tension? Do you multiply it? Do you see what we are like? Now we leave seminary with all our own ideas and our own enthusiasm to do mission. This is what the Lord wants you to do. But you come to realize pretty quickly that there are hurdles that you never envisage to get over because you thought that everyone would have the same vision as you had and that everyone would do in mission the way that you want to do mission. So, you bring your ideas to your elders, to your leaders, as we in our context to Kirk session, and the first thing you're met with, we don't do it that way here. You go to Presbytery. Presbytery is where you have ministers and elders from the area that you live in. Here we have the Edinburgh Presbytery. And you speak, you suggest something, and you're met with a stony, stony silence. There's a possibility that you would have to deal with church committees. Now that's another story. I remember at a talk we had when we were here as students, Kenny MacDonald said to us, if you can avoid church committees, do so at all costs. Because you will not have time for it because you're too busy in your own ministry. And I can guarantee you that that is true. But yet we need people to go on committees. So what are you going to do? You leave seminary, you're all enthusiastic about evangelizing Scotland, and you find that on every church court there is a stumbling block and it's bringing you down. What keeps you going? First of all, you preach the gospel to yourself daily. That brings us back to basics. You are what you are by the grace of God. Secondly, you remember your calling. God has called you into his service. You believe it to be God's call. And for some reason or another, God has called you to be a co-worker with him in the best work ever. Now, that is humbling, that God has called you into that work. That should not puff our pride up. Because there's a danger of that. There's a danger of thinking that we are better than others. We should never think that we are better than our current session, our leaders or our elders. We should never think we're better than those who are in presbytery with us. We should never think that we are better than our church committees. Why? Because you have preached the gospel to yourself. 
and you remind yourself that you are nothing. You are, as Jesus was, he made himself of no reputation. He made himself a nobody. That is the example we are to follow. As this is the annual Macmillan Lectures, I want you to listen to what Reverend David Patterson, a friend of Professor Macmillan, said in his obituary about Douglas. This was in the monthly record shortly after his death. The General Assembly called Douglas to the chair of Church History and Principles in 1982. He brought his own special humour, effervescence and godliness into the college. He was friend to both students and colleagues. While he recognised that the function of professors and students were different, he also observed a Christian equality. Both served the same Lord, both were saved by the same grace. For his students he desired and prayed that academic proficiency would be linked to the evangelistic passion and above all that they would be men of God. First, you preach the gospel to yourself daily. Secondly, you remember your calling from God. But then thirdly, I think you will learn to be patient. And I think it is important, that is with your fellow workers and with your colleagues. Always remember, always remembering of how patient God is with us. How patient God is with you. It's interesting how you find that if you wait a while, things do begin to pan out the way you were looking for them to happen. You see, through your preaching, you can generate an atmosphere that changes things subtly. And before you know it, others are suggesting what your intentions were. And what eases tension within church courts is that the leadership suggests what you were wanting to suggest and now things are happening without you having to open your mouth and it's so much easier for folk to accept. Listen to something else that David Patterson said about Professor Macmillan. There can be little doubt that Douglas Macmillan had a special extra from God Although he was an able teacher and became a church statesman, known for his wisdom, fairness, understanding, sympathy and breadth of vision, he was above all a great preacher, but more. He was the kind of Christian who won the hearts of the people. He loved people and people loved him. He never denied his own personal flaws. He knew the need of ongoing pardon and the secret of experiencing it. And this gave him a special ability to promise the help of God to those in spiritual need. There was another obituary written for the Scotsman, I believe it was by Principal Don MacLeod. He said he was more than a preacher. He was a larger-than-life personality, a remarkable blend of vitality, laughter and sheer godliness. To children, he was a big, jolly Santa Claus. To young men, the epitome of craggy masculinity. To the church as a whole, a unifying figure who was a friend to everyone and a crony to no one. What an example Douglas was to us all. Well, we've looked at tension within ourselves. We have seen tension between ourselves and others. Finally, how do we deal with tension between the church and the world? Well, the best example for us is what the Lord himself taught us in his word. And in his ministry, as he sent out the twelve in Luke Chapter 9, he sent out the twelve apostles, and notice what he says. 
Notice what it says. He called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now the thing is, this great privilege God has entrusted to us to carry on with the work that he himself came to establish, to accomplish. Now listen to what he said to the disciples in the upper room in John fourteen twelve. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that these 12 people, these hoi polloi of Galilee, are going to do greater things than he ever did. But not only that, <coughs> this includes you as well. It says that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. That is you, and that is the commission that he's given you. But Luke records also the apostles' empowerment for ministry. Power there speaks of capacity, energy, or force. That is what the Lord is doing as he's preparing you for ministry over these next few months and years. And then he gives you the authority here to use that. In the right place, the authority that he himself has given you the power to do so. Now it's interesting when you think of the ministry that he gave them to do. He spoke about healing and he spoke about preaching. What do we have there? Well, that is to preach. That is to minister, sorry, to the physical, that is healing, and to the spiritual, that is preaching. And that is important in our own ministries. When I was studying here in, in Edinburgh, way back, so we came here in 2001, and uh, Bob Ackroyd used to go to a Stowers meeting down in Leith, and I started going along with him because that was something, part of my ministry, that I wanted to do. And that is working with people in road recovery or Stowers, you know, I don't have to explain to you what Stowers means, but that is helping folk with addictions and uh, to help them, to help them physically and to help them spiritually. There was a couple of things that stuck in my mind at the meetings down in Leith. And one of them was the day or the evening that Willie prayed and he said, I want to thank God for today I have been 100 days sober. There was another lady there and to be honest... She looked 70, if she was a day, but she was only about seemingly 45, but she had tough days. And I asked her one evening, why did she come? And she said, do you know, she said, this is the safest two hours of my week. Back at home, she said anything could happen. Now the question is, do we Christians see that as being important? To give these two safe hours to people? Is it important to get people off the drink, off drugs? Imagine the impact that has on a family. There was a wee boy, and quite often you find teachers on a Monday morning, they usually give the children news of what happened over the weekend, just to give them time to bed in for a new day, for a new day of teaching. So this lady gave this this teacher gave the, the children the usual task. And this wee boy, all he wrote down was this. We had dinner on Friday evening. And she asked him, what do you mean by that? She said, do you know, he said, we had meat, we had potatoes, we had peas, and we had pudding for the first time on Friday evening. And she said, why is that? Because my dad came home. And he gave my mom his wages for the very first time. He was saved by grace, an alcoholic. Imagine how that changed that family household. Now the thing is this, 
It is for us to look after people physically. And the saving is ultimately up to God. But we have to do both ministries, and that is what we have here, physical and spiritual. Of course, we tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That lady, there was tension in her home all week. But for this two hours, she felt safe in the company of Christians. And that is an environment that was put in place, albeit for a short period of time. Well, the conclusion then to our talk is, what is the ultimate answer? Well, the ultimate answer to a tension-filled world. We know that the solution is Jesus Christ. That is why you are here. That is why you are preparing yourselves for ministry. When we started Road to Recovery in Carloway, that was in my previous charge, in Lewis, there was a chap who came for the first night. I got to know him over a few months and then invited him to come to one of our meetings. And as we developed the meeting, you had a time of prayer, you had a time of sitting down with God's word and then explaining the word. And he said, after a period of time, he said, can we not do this without the Jesus bit? And I said to him, no, just listen, listen for a while, just stay with us and listen. Six years later, he was still there, and I remember going one night, and to be honest, I was totally cheesed off, because I felt, if anything, they were worse than ever. I thought they weren't listening to anything we were saying to them, and now this is six years on. I didn't prepare anything. I thought, what's the point? So by then you got to know them so well, they were your mates, they were your pals. And I said to them, what's happening? Are you not listening to anything we're saying? And to be honest, you're worse than ever. (laughs) And this same guy who came the first night and said, can we not do this without the Jesus bit? Do you know what he said? If it wasn't for these meetings, I would be dead now. And what a lesson for us to keep giving them God's word. Four years have now passed since then and my pal Angie has passed away and I believe that he's gone into the presence of his Lord the chap who came let's do it without Jesus I believe now is in the arms of Jesus he gave up drinking and a couple of months after that he was told that he was terribly ill and he was saying what is that But yet it was a means of drawing him to get to know his Saviour and to know his Lord. The answer to his problem was Jesus and he is the answer to all of our problems. But you know there's something really interesting in that passage in Luke chapter 10. When you tell about Jesus, will you do what the apostles did? It says this in in verse 10. On their return, the apostles told them all that they had done. Have you ever sat down with him and told him what exactly your day has been like? Every detail? You see, it's our danger. It's danger. Our danger really in the sense is that we, well, he knows anyway. Do you think he didn't know about what the disciples were up to as he sent them out? But yet he wanted to hear it from them. And you know, there's nothing like it than speaking to your Lord. Just as if you're just telling him of what your day was like. And you know, he loves to hear the voice of his own. Do we tell him how our day went? Well, as God is preparing you to go out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Be assured of your calling and may God equip you to minister to a lost, tense world. And chill out. Give others the benefit of the doubt, even though you know that they're wrong. May God make us 
unifying figures, just as Professor Macmillan was a friend to everyone and a crony to no one. Kenny, I think we have some time. If there's anybody who would like to make any comments, any questions, I'm sure Kenny would be quite pleased to, to answer. You've got to be careful for the people that sit in the back row. Mr. Robertson, any, any comments? Ah. <laughs> All right. This is <laughs> I'm interested in the tension between a minister and Kirk Session. Mm. Uh, you touched upon it, and my, you gave a wee bit of an idealistic answer. Um, could you say some more about it and how you cope with it? Because I, 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 don't, I don't know of anything that causes more hassle in ministry. Yeah. Than division in your own church or tension, that kind of tension. I mean, you've got to have some kind of creative tension because if you all love one another and all agree with one another, then you're lying. Um, <laughs> so you've got to have some kind of tension. But how do you cope with it and how do you move it on? Well, I think you always, in the sense where I spoke about by preaching the gospel to yourself. And you realize, and Douglas Macmillan himself spoke about, where he spoke about his student, he saw them equally in the sense that they're all saved and the same grace is given to all. So I think it's important to listen to what our current session is saying. To be honest, we could be wrong and they could be, they could be showing us that we are wrong. And sometimes that's hard for us to accept. But I think through time you earn the respect of one another and you you agree to differ as you get to know them and you do grow to love them I believe whatever situation that possibly someone who is pulls apart from you but that doesn't mean that you don't love that person in the Lord and I think that helps when you when you look at them that way I understand fully what you're saying being in the two contexts of what in my ministry has been quite different to the church I was in, as an elder in Smith. But then there was tension there as well. You know, so it doesn't matter what context you're going to get different views. And where you have people, there's going to be different views. Because there's tension within the marriage. So I don't know if that helps. I still want to plug it out a little bit more. Because the tension is necessary between the minister and the elders. It could be between different members of session could be different visions, but let's deal with that particular one. Yeah. What if you've got a church session where the majority of the elders believe that they're there to prevent the minister doing stupid things, and the minister believes that he's there to push the congregation forward, um, which the majority of the elders consider to be a stupid thing? What if you've got that kind of tension? I, I know you love your fellow, you yeah. know, I, I hope that you would love each other anyway. Yeah. But when you got that kind of tension, how do you... Because some guys get really frustrated. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's where it's important uh, to meet with your elders before you accept a call. And because you need to get to know where they're coming from, and they need to know where you're coming from. And if you do that, at least you know what you're letting yourself in for. And they know what they're letting themselves It might not be... Uh, it might be worse than they thought it was going to be. I think quite often, in my case, that is the way it's been. <laughs> but you can't help it. Your personality is what you are. You are what, how God saved you. And you do want to do ministry as best as you can. But you have to take others along with you. And you're trying to do that as best as possible. And it is incredible, through time, through teaching and preaching... Things do change, and people change their minds. And we do ourselves. And you notice that within Kirk Sessions as well. And I think that is so refreshing, because we're reforming together. They might not be going as quickly as you would like them to, but then the Lord knows that. 
and we just and, and sometimes we try to push God on, on issues and uh, sometimes we just have to chill out and, and take our time and does that help? Oh, absolutely. Think, uh, one more. Do you think that um, maybe sometimes you should involve presbyteries? Maybe that's what they're for. Or do you just wait until everything goes? Well, uh, the, that is something coming from working in industry. I can't understand in regards to uh, our system. I think there should be more accountability. I feel there should be accountability with the minister if if presbyteries are line manager. We should give a detailed account of what we're doing, and I'm all for that. I feel that is healthy for ourselves because, to be honest, a conquenial happened <coughs> once every five years, and you could do a lot of damage in that period of time. And before they come in to sort it out, it could be too far gone. So I think accountability, we're looking at that as a presbytery ourselves, the possibility of doing that once a year. Uh, within our strategy in the Glasgow Presbytery, everyone giving a report of how things are going. So, yeah, accountability is important. Yeah. Um, I guess if, if um, what we're about is the evangelization of Scotland and the world, we need more than ministers or isolated folk engaging in evangelism. Have you thoughts from your experience, what you've seen, of how to under the Lord's shape of church culture where evangelism, where speaking for Christ is just part of the DNA of, of what we do as a church family, not yeah. just the, the professionals as well. Yeah, I, I feel everything is changing in regards to that. And I think uh, the laws of state is making a change for us as well in church or as a PVG and situations like that. And you feel more and more in ministry that you feel that you need I would say a female worker to be working with you where families and vulnerable people where you can't go and visit yourself so that's important it is important to have youth workers and it's important to have we have just recently employed uh, Stuart Johnson in Paisley to do ministry assistant working with us in Paisley because we've been trying to entice someone to come to Paisley I'm so enthusiastic about Paisley but no one else seems to catch the bug because what we have is between 80 and 100,000 folk and we've been trying to get an assistant for a while. So now we're going down this route to see if someone can do the groundwork for us to do, put in place all the ministries that we're hoping to do. Simple things like parent and toddler groups, uh, status groups, to do uh, evangelism, looking at doing an afternoon service like a Madras Street type in Inverness to get people to come in through our door. So looking at doing ministry in different ways, we do a cafe on a Saturday at Downvale in Glasgow, and that's a great ministry of getting people from the community through our doors. Now, no one has come upstairs yet to the sanctuary on a Sunday service, but that doesn't say that what's been done on the Saturday morning is <coughs> ministry. We have spoke about the physical needs of people. We're feeding them. Now, people say, that there's, people say, well, certain people are taking advantage of that. Well, I wondered how Jesus felt after feeding 5,000. We're told shortly after that that many of the disciples stopped following him. And he just fed possibly up to 10,000 people. So we need to expect uh, these things. So all that we can do in ministry, it is a different day. And we need to go into a Scotland that has shown apathy towards the gospel, to be honest. And we are struggling in Paisley and in Partick to get locals in. Sometimes you, you think possibly it's my accent because we are known, we're still known in Partick as a Gaelic church. So that's a huge stumbling block. The, the Paisley church is known as a Gaelic church. Now if we're to be as diverse as the community we live in, we need to change that within our community and it's, it's not easy. And of course we do welcome Gales to our church. Just that. Yeah. Kenny, you came from Carnley, which has a few less people in Glasgow. What sort of lesson did you learn in any changed approach to your evangelism and coming somewhere bigger? Well, 
To be honest, whatever you go, a sinner is it's a sinner in Carloway as he is in Glasgow. And there are many issues that took place in Carloway, in Glasgow, happen in Carloway as well. So in that way, nothing's different. We are dealing with the same issues, same people, same problems. In the city, obviously, it's, I find it's exciting. I believe Paul was a city man, and not saying that I'm like the Apostle Paul, but um, it's exciting, the city and, and the work there, and you see so many things. So it's just basically trying to do what we learned in the eight years in a rural setting. But I still feel that, to be honest, Partick is a town within a city, and they're quite clannish, the Partick folk. And is working within that context. Obviously, we have we're doing a cafe for international students. There's a huge block that's been built down the road, and James Ross is doing that with us, with other congregations, Glasgow Cities involved with us, and Crow Roads involved. So we're getting people so that we're working together as a denomination. That's important. And it's just basically learning about their needs. We went in, when we went in, we thought, right, okay, we're gonna do we heard about Ross Keane doing food banks, and we thought, well, that's great, we'll do that. Now, to be honest, it didn't work. We had loads and loads of packs at Christmas time, and only four of them went out in Partick. You see, folk are proud. And to be added a food bank or a partial, they say, well, I don't need that. So most of them went somewhere else to a more deprived area. And so we've learned, you have to learn. We meet with counsellors, we ask them, where do you see the need in our community? We try to meet with them from time to time and just to speak about you know, the, these practical issues. So it's basically getting to learn. Sit down, listen to what the needs are in our community. It's amazing. We've, uh, to be honest, we're landlocked where we are in Partick, and we're too small, and St. Peter's across the road has been bought. This is a school that's closed, it's been bought by, uh, it's been bought by Partick Housing Association. So I went in to see them the other day, because we used to rent the hall. Were you there, Mark, when they used to use the hall? It's a massive hall, and it's just straight off the street. Our problem is you have to go downstairs to our hall. So it's amazing how things work. You know, you go to Party Housing Association and you expect to get a Glasgow accent spoken back. And what was a lady from Sky? And uh, I told her what I was wanting. And she said, where are you from? Are you from Lewis? I said, no, no, I'm from Harris. That's worse, she said. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, I told her uh, of what we were wanting to do. You know, we were looking to rent the hall of Party Housing Association. So could she look into this? And she said, she said, you'll never guess, she said, where in whose hands I'm going to place this bit of paper. His mother comes from Scarpe. Well, I said, make sure that you tell him that the minister's from Scarpe. So sometimes we see how the Lord works. It might not come to anything. He might say, no, don't give to him. It's a bit of tension between us. <laughs> or, you know, you don't know. So we're always looking at means. It would be lovely to have a place where we could be open. We had Bethany with us last Wednesday evening. They spoke about partnering with congregations in Glasgow. Now if they could do something with us, you could have a place that could be open every day. That's the world we live in, is looking at a community-based church. Yeah. Um, you've talked an awful lot about um, things we can do in the community. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe expand on how that relates to telling people about Jesus and how to interface with each other. Yeah, well, obviously, obviously, you know, I met a guy on um, on Sunday. He came to church for the very first time. I saw him sitting at the back. He had, after the second singing, he put the, the notices on his Bible like that. He was, you, you could see he was going to leave. And he did leave before the end of the psalm. He went out. But what was interesting was... He was still outside after the service. He was hanging about. And uh, I went up to speak to him. And uh, I asked him who he was. And he said, he said, I felt, he said, my life's in a mess. My auntie advised me to come to church to seek faith. And he said, that's why I came today. But I felt really awkward. He says, I was on my own. And he said, I didn't know what to do. So I left. But he said, thanks for coming to speak to me. 
And I said to him, can you tell me something about yourself? And he said, well, he said, once I get to know you better, I'll do that. And I think that's important. That is what we did in Carlo. We, we took a year before we started a road recovery meeting. But what I did first was going to meet these guys in their homes. And when you meet someone on their own turf, they open out more, they're more comfortable with you. And you always get an opportunity to pray with them. So you get to build, you're building up a relationship with that person. Now, this guy, I hope he comes back, I give him my number, but we have to build. And that is you building trust between yourself and people. There's a long way to go. And I think there's been such a division between ourselves and the world that we sometimes forget it's such a big gulf. But that is by what, what helps us is by preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. It takes us back to where God took us from, where he saved us from, and that takes us back to where they are for some.